Hello, and welcome to Varm Blog. And in files of progressivism and democratic socialism and decay, we come to today's bit of news. And a report to Business Insider, which I'm going to share with you guys in a second. AOC says the Democratic Socialists and the Justice Democrats were responsible for her first election win. Quote, when it looked appealing enough, they jumped in, unquote. Now, look, I'm not here to disparage the good name of everyone's favorite Ted Kennedy staffer. Nor am I here to pretend that AOC on the block was anything more than what was likely to be an attempt to create another Nancy Pelosi. If you know Pelosi's history, she served a similar function in California to what AOC does in New York. 20, you know, almost 40 years ago in the early 1980s. I've made this point now for several years. In fact, I've made it before in 2018 and 2019. I've also pointed out that, we you know, that most of what Murray Bookchin critiqued in Bernie Sanders in, in the early 1980s was still true in 2016. When I was forced kicking and screaming by friends into support, into being uh, more supportive of the Sanders campaign, actually even becoming, uh, doing the one thing that I have avoided doing my entire life, um, registering as a Democrat so I could vote in the primaries for Sanders in 2020 under the auspices of my friends who really thought that he was going to win. And when he didn't win, they started coming up with almost conspiracy-like reasons for why Sanders was stopped. Never mind the fact that Sanders outsider uh, campaign status had actually been somewhat mitigated by his stances during the Trump period. And while, yes, people are finally catching up with that now since his positions on, is on the Israel-Palestine conflict, while still too pro-Palestinian enough for our friends in Germany and the SPA day, uh, as essentially the same line of the Biden administration with a little bit more peon to temporary ceasefires, which are now well over. I say this as we are into December in 2023. Now, uh, AOC said the Democratic Socialists and the Justice Democrats weren't responsible for, for election. And you know what? She's right. Now, uh, that doesn't change the craven nature of what she's saying whatsoever. But it's time that we just looked at what's happening to progressivism and democratic socialism. I know a lot of people feel heartened about the new left being smaller but better because of its stances on things like Palestine. But as I've said, it's easy to oppose a genocide when you're not going to do anything about it. Now, I'm not going to shit on people for going to anti- Israel and pro-Palestinian demonstrations any more than I'm going to shit on people for going to anti-war protests. But it's funny to me that the people who agree with my logic on how ineffective the anti-war process were have all of a sudden forgotten that in regards to Palestine. Nonetheless, here we are. You see, it has always been easy for when milk when milk toast progressive and social democratic and democratic socialist politics fell at home for them to become radical abroad and almost also conservative in their responses. This tends to be what happens. You have a sense of people who pick up the methodological nationalism and democratic socialism and social democracy and take it to the next logical step and become weirdo populist. And you have people who focus on the international stuff, because if you're going to fail at stuff, you might as well fail at stuff that you have no hope in actually affecting, as opposed to failing at stuff where you have some hope of actually affecting. But no, let's talk about how the AOC brings this out. I'm going to share this article with you guys. It'll also be linked in the show notes. Ocasio-Cortez, a pain in the relent uh, relentlessly in the 14th Congressional District, anchored in the Bronx and Queens, arguing that its main constituents, nudging its burgeoning Latino and working class immigrant communities, were underrepresented. Absolutely true, although that wasn't what she was 
actually arguing for at the time. And her rise of prominence was also accompanied by stories of the growing influence of progressive groups, which are often credited with helping her defeat Crawley. But in a newly released book, The Squad, Arcasio uh, Cortez author told Ryan Grimm, oh, I love Ryan Grimm. Ryan Grimm, you're exactly who I thought you were. That she didn't defeat Crowley in the congressional primary because of left-wing groups like the Justice Democrats and the Democratic Socialists. Like, as much as I loved them, I did not with my re- election because of the DSA or even the Justice Democrats, any of these orgs. They either abandoned, ignored, or fought with me and then swooped in in the last minute when I was busted my whole ass for the whole time to become remotely viable. Now, she doesn't mention her own membership in one of those groups. Nonetheless, uh, the rewriting of history makes sense. They all had important contributions, but to be honest, they were pretty much nowhere until the last month before the primary, which I often feel about uh, about these things. You know, I'm, I'm glad we have a lot of Palestinian support out there, but uh, where were you in 2001? when I was talking about how bleak it was and how this was likely going to end up in an ethnic cleansing. And I felt with no hope. Now, yes, there were plenty of people supporting BDS, but they were also pretending like that was a possibly viable thing for one of the, for one of the world's foremost military developers. And not just for the U.S., I might add. Always coming the owl of Minerva flying at dusk. So that's the funny thing about it all, huh? The reflections from Otacio Cortez, who was elected in the House in 2018 general election and re-elected in 20 and 2022. I mean, it, a, a shoe can get re-elected in that dem, in that district that has a Democrat on it. Otacio Cortez has become increasingly less popular inter, uh, nationally. Uh, and so for all the people who told me in 2019 that it now that Bernie had failed, that maybe after Biden, the AOC squad moment would lead to the new direction of the Democrats, a more progressive, integrated, you know, so a democratic socialist like national party. That ain't happening. Progressivism is less popular than it's ever been. I just want to show you this. Uh, I'm going to look it up, but let's see. Uh, The progressive movement has uh, been taking a hit since 2022. They lost, you know, a lot in the primaries. Yeah, they gained a couple of mayors because the the centrist nothing suits like Lori Lightfoot uh, are useless. But the problem is that they're that these mayors are going to hit the realities of municipal bomb markets very quickly. I mean, even California is running problems with its progressive agenda because it's running such a deficit since half of its funding comes from capital gains tax. And yet these are the people we want to save us. And of course, it, it's funny because uh, the DSA has been a thorn in Acacio Ocasio's side. And in some ways, she's right. They didn't really get her elected. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, yes, she's in the DSA too, but she she owes way more of her success to to the need of representation and to being a Ted Kennedy staffer. Like, let's not leave this. uh, Going, you know, going on. The reflections from Arcacio Kiss, who was elected, uh, but she remarked on difficulty she encountered in a second term is becoming increasingly point of pushback from some progressives. That time really forced me to sit with who my base was, she told Graham, because for a while, it did not feel like the left. Oh, it, it didn't? Imagine that. Graham noted that while he'd so he, the progressive strategist and former spokesman person for the Justice Democrats, had aided Arcasio Cortez in bidding her campaign early on. And the book he detailed how the Justice Democrats at one point had focused their email and donor list on bringing fundraising dollars for Arcasio Cortez. Yeah, that was funny. But Graham also wrote in the book that Arcasio Cortez felt the work performed by Justice Democrats, which had played a more robust moral in some aspects of her campaign, had started to melt. Uh, meld in with that of the Democratic Socialist of America, uh, whose assistance was helpful, but came at a much later time. 
oh, funny how this all comes out. There's a certain faction of the left that thinks that they uh, that they own or are responsible for electing a candidate just because that candidate happens to be ideological, ideologically left on their own, the congresswoman told Graham. But the actual work of getting elected is just these armchair people who talk shit who don't do shit. And listening to these people who don't do shit is how you lose what you've built. And by what you've built, of course, we mean your seat where you more or less don't achieve anything um for progressive causes that you believe in except occasionally softening biden's crushing of a railroad strike when of course Grimm was on that tail end too and now can use the success of the uaw and the dsa's role in that to soften their role the reality of the situation is none of these people had the had the authority to really push back and by authority i meant numbers and ability in funding to push back on something like the Cortez campaign. And when DSAers now talk about holding elective accountable, accountable as they're also getting smaller, what electives are they going to fucking hold accountable? And how are they going to do it? You don't have the donor money to do that. You don't have the people power to do it. Most of you aren't even in the district of which ocasio Cortez lives, which is why you don't have much of effect. She's not popular nationally anyway. One of the ironies of becoming a leftist darling is that it's a, it's a way to draw a big fucking target on your back. Not just towards, you know, conservatives, but also to independents and people who find a lot of the posturing obnoxious. This is what happens in decay. But let me further point out that when you start focusing on taking the most radical positions abroad and doing nothing domestically, what you're actually showing is you don't really, you're not really able to do either. So while you might personally care and have moral concerns about what happens to Palestinians, I mean, fuck, we, that you should, and I hope you do. At the same time, pretending that these massive protests are going to stop anything because they're putting pressure on Biden. My friend, what happens to the Biden administration? If it looks like Netanyahu ignores them when they allow a ceasefire to go through the Security Council, yeah, that's not going to happen, right? Not just because they don't want it to happen because they secretly support Israel more than they're saying. They might actually be shocked at how blatant and discrediting all this is getting. You know, slow ethnic cleansing is one thing. Approaching, you know, uh, 20, 30, you know, 20, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 dead in Gaza, literally like, I don't know, a fourth of the population, half of which are women and children, many of which have nothing to do with Hamas, other than the fact that they live there and that Hamas has been in charge of that, uh, of Gaza since 2006, because there's nothing else no other option in town and it hasn't been an election nor does israel want them to have one no like of course that's discrediting but what does it look for the u.s when they can't even have the imperialists play by better rules and not having the worst elements of the idf doing things that got people you know court-martialed in the iraq war when it happened when it got out of an abu grave that's embarrassing to empire. And it's actually, yes, it's proof of relative U.S. decline, but it's also proof that no one's stepping in to, like, stop these things from happening. And that's not even getting to me, you know, how much I foresee, like, what's happening with potentially, as I talk about this on, De on December 10th, with uh, Guyana and, and Venezuela where the Venezuela Marxist-Leninist party is calling for peace talks and then American Marxist-Leninists are trying to uh, defend the Maduro government. The whole thing just shows you that it's all in the K. Now, the K doesn't have to be the end of the, of the situation. But most people can't look at this for what it is. They're not going to. They're going to pretend that, like, uh, that some campus response to all this is going to actually help. 
It's not. But you're going to see that um, the progressives that we we supported um, and yeah, like AOC said her life is completely transformed for the better after after Pelosi stepped down from leadership, you know, but it's also transformed for the better since, since uh, the Democrats don't have to be responsible for anything. It's funny how that all works, huh? What you will see is this is going to go the same way it did in the 70s and 80s. And similarly, the left being focused on international issues while it can't do anything domestically, which means it also can't do anything on international issues, will be an indication of their ultimate long-run decline. Be honest with yourself. If you look at this honestly, there's ways out. It doesn't have to go down this way. But what incentives do you have to do that? How brave are you? Not in the face of international competition or incurring climate or whatever apocalypse that you think that you're going to get lucky and have apocalypse solved for you. Because, my friend, that's not going to happen. It's going to be long and slow. Rome doesn't fall in a day. And also remember, there wasn't necessarily a new Rome on the horizon. Seeing any of these things as unilaterally good or bad for the proletarian world movement is to miss the point. With this decay, we could do something. We could build something out of this fecund matter, of this rot. We could use it to fertilize new soil. But will we? That's a question. And one that I cannot answer. Maybe you can. Like and subscribe, hit the bell, have a good day. Mm -hmm.